Okay, chapter three of the book of Luke is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so if you've been following the videos, of course, notice we're in the third chapter of Luke, so still at the beginning of the, the gospel of Luke. But now we are at Jesus' baptism, which is right at the beginning of his ministry. So in three chapters, we've gone from birth to the 12-year-old story to 30-year-old Jesus, basically. Uh, there's a lot that was not said about Jesus' life in any of the gospels that we don't have. And so hopefully we can, like I mentioned at the end of the last video, hopefully we can find some of those records and, and get more information. So now verse 1 in chapter 3, let's get into this. This is, this is again, Jesus' baptism. So we see John the Baptist coming back into the scene with Jesus now. Uh, verse 1, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being the governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Ituria, and of the region of Tracon Traconitis, and Licinius the tetrarch of Abilene. So verse 1 helps us understand historical timing, okay? This is an interesting thing because it, it doesn't say in the year, whatever, whatever. They didn't necessarily think that way back then. They didn't understand what year it was as opposed to all the, you know, the year, the timing we have, like this is the year 2024 as the day of recording this, 2024 AD or CE, depending on which measurement you have, which means it's been 2024 years since zero, which is when Christ was probably around three-ish years old, three or four years old. And so, you know, BC, the time before that, the Old Testament time counts down to zero, and then we count up. So that time, that timing, that scale of understanding time uh, didn't exist till I think the 17, maybe it was, maybe it was a little bit earlier, the 1700s. It didn't exist for a long time. So even back then, they didn't have a year that they marked. This is the this is year four AD or whatever. So this is the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. So they would measure from a major event that could be measured in time. So Tiberius has been basically Caesar for 15 years. That's that's what it means. So in his 15th year of reign, basically. So that's how they would indicate where the, some kind of a time reference, basically. So Tiberius is Caesar, Pontius Pilate is governor of Judea, Herod is the Tetrarch in Galilee, and his brother is the Tetrarch in uh, Iturea and the region of Traconitis, and Licinius is the Tetrarch of Abilene. So we can see that, remember Herod, after Herod the Great, he divides his, his rule into among his sons. And so that's, we're seeing that, that these are the different levels of government, basically. And so we're seeing that play out. Now, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar is a little difficult to calculate because Darius ruled jointly with Augustus uh, starting in 12 AD and then as sole emperor in 14 AD. If Luke meant the first date, which scholars often favor, then the date would be 26 or 27 AD. If he intended the latter date when Tiberius was sole ruler, then the date would be 28 or 29 AD. Also, 15 years is probably to be counted inclusively, but that is also uncertain. The date range thus falls between 26 and 29 AD. Herod and Tippets was the tetrarch, Herod Antipas, excuse me, was the tetrarch of Galilee. Uh, Pilate ruled Judah, Judah from 26 until 36 AD. That's from Wayman in the New Testament, his book. It's a great book. So it's around that time from 26 to uh, 29 AD is when chapter 3 is taking place. Verse 2, Annas and, Caph and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So now Annas and Caiaphas are the high priests in Jerusalem. They're running the temple and, and uh, the, the, the Sanhedrin and all that. So while they're the high priests, uh, the word of God came to John in the wilderness. So this is like a inspiration or revelation to John the Baptist. Verse 3, And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So this is stuff that John's being told. This is, you're going to teach, you're going to do this. Hey, go over here. We need you to go this way. So he's being led by the Spirit and taught by the Spirit uh, and angels and things as well for his mission. They didn't have necessarily a lot of scripture to back him up other than the prophecies of Elias. 
So he's being taught by angels and others to help him to do his ministry. So now he comes down to the country around Jordan. Uh, verse 4, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So again, they had some prophecy that would point to John and go, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, but then they needed to fill in details, which is where like angels and inspiration would have helped him out. Verse 5, every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight. The rough ways shall be made smooth. Now, this is an interesting point to look at, okay? This is his, this is part of the message of John. So, prepare you the way the Lord, make his paths straight. So, this is a metaphor, okay? Making his paths, the Lord's paths, straight. So, what happens when you have lots of valleys and hills? Your roads wander. You can't see to the other end of the road. It goes around a hill. It goes over a hill. It goes, you know, so you, there's there's blind spots in it. You don't know where it, that road is going. It's unclear the path. So in verse 5, when it says, every valley shall be filled and every mountain shall be brought low, meaning flat earth, not some people think an earthquake, so the mountains are going to come down and the, the mountain height will come down and fill the valleys and it'll all be flat. Uh, you could, maybe that's one way to think about how it'll be filled, but this is more metaphorically, basically, than, than a, like a literal prophecy of what's going to happen. Uh, but it's more about realizing that it's time to be clear and obvious, and, and it's clear the paths of God are straight, okay? They'll be made, made straight and smooth. So the path to Christ, this is important, our journey in our life is coming to Christ. The path to Christ is not fraught with crazy unknown stuff. It's not an Indiana Jones type journey to get to Christ. It is flat, straight, and clear how to get to Christ. In fact, it is so simple, a lot of people freak out and have a hard time with it because it is so simple. It's not complicated. It's not hard. It's clear. It's easy to understand. And it works. It's not overcoming great odds. It is easy. Making the paths straight. So imagine a road running through mountains, curving, going around mountains, over mountains, into valleys, all over the place. All of it comes flat, flat earth, and a straight, clear, smooth road to God. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the message. That's what what Jesus brought uh, brought was here to teach us, that's what it is, the straight and narrow path. The problem is, is we as humans love to make things complicated. We love to make things hard. And we think if it's hard, it's, a, it's more important. It's more valuable for us to do. And Christ is going, no, it isn't. You don't, I made it easy for you. It's not that hard to just follow me. Just stay on this path. Keep my commandments. Follow this. It's not that hard, really. Uh, that's what it is. So verse 6 is continuing what John is saying, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Who's the salvation of God? Jesus is the salvation of God. Now, why is it God's salvation? This is God doesn't need saved necessarily, but God needs someone to save his children. So the salvation of God is bringing his family back to him. That's Jesus' job. That's what he's going to do. Verse 7, and then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. And Matthew, he, he in this story, Matthew talks about where he's, he is, some Sadducees and Pharisees come out to see John and understand him. And so he's talking to the Sadducees and Pharisees basically about this. Uh, so this is... Uh, so John's preaching baptism. Now, here's the thing is we don't hear of the Sadducees and Pharisees hating necessarily John. They're not like, we got to kill John. He's being, he's a, he's a threat to us. What John is doing is using immersion in the river as a ritual cleansing process. They had at the temple ritual cleansing things that you did as well. So the, the idea of what John is doing is not unheard of. It's, they just see him as a different faction of the 
these different ideas between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Zealots. These, these groups are all Jewish and they all follow the law of Moses, but sometimes they interpret it a little differently. And they just saw John as one of those other interpretations. Remember, John didn't go to jail because the Pharisees wanted him there. John went to jail because Herod didn't like him. And he got killed, not because the Pharisees wanted him dead, but because Herod's wife wanted him dead, Herodias. So that's important to realize. There wasn't, the Pharisees and Sadducees don't show us in the New Testament, they had much of a beef with John. They probably didn't like some of his teachings, like this idea of the coming Messiah and prepare, prepare. But again, there were other people saying that they were the Messiah. If you look at even the story of Barabbas, he was, his name means son of the father. He was a revolutionary. He was trying to foment revolution and get the Jews to fight against Rome, to overcome and throw off Rome's oppression on them. Uh, so it wasn't an uncommon theme at this time to think about preaching a Messiah. Uh, in fact, if you remember the, the uh, story of the shepherds from Luke chapter 2, the, the previous one, the shepherds told everybody, an angel told us a Messiah was just born. So people are like, okay, this Messiah is going to be around 30 years old right now, so he's got to be old enough to do stuff. Where is he? What's going on? So all that's in this culture and in what's going on at the time, basically. So John is railing against the Sadducees and Pharisees saying, O generation of vipers. Now he's not calling them the viper necessarily, but the offspring of vipers. So he's talking about how things went corrupt long before they were here, but they are the results of the corruption, previous corruption of, of priests before. Verse 8, Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now, this is something that some people have talked about before. So we want to talk about this case. Okay? People are saying, basically, what, what John is railing against here is the people are saying, because I am a, I'm a literal descendant of Abraham, I am a genetic descendant of Abraham, that I'm saved. Being a descendant of Abraham means I'm saved. I don't have to do anything myself. I'm just, by default, a chosen person and I get to go to heaven. Uh, that's the problem is a lot of people thought they were automatically saved by descendants, by lineage. And John's going, no, that's not true. You don't get saved because somebody else was great. You get saved yourself. You have to work this out yourself. So in fact, Joseph Smith uh, in his Joseph Smith translation of the Bible a justice one, he says here uh, for verse 8, Abraham is our father. We have kept the commandments of God and none can inherit the promises but the children of Abraham. For I say, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. So, or for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. So here's the thing. John's going, look guys, if, if God wanted a chosen people, he could turn these stones into chosen people and guarantee their, their salvation. That's not the point. The point is you need to work it out. It's a Life is a test. That's what it comes down to, okay? Abraham's not on trial. The, the scriptures aren't on trial. You are on trial. That's the point of this life. So it's you that need to bring forth the fruits worthy of repentance. You need to be willing to repent of your sins, forsake them, and come towards Christ. Get on that straight and narrow path that we talked about. Uh, in fact, there's a warning in verse 9, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now, this is important because, again, this is not a predestination type idea, which is what they were thinking about. I'm a, I'm a member of the Abrahamic family, so I'm predestined to be saved. I don't have to worry about it. No, 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 no. The fruit, so the choices the tree makes, which results in the fruit, is going to determine who is cut down and cast in the fire and who is not. It's not the tree itself. It's not where the tree was planted. It's not where, which seed from which other tree did that tree come from. It is the fruit. So the choices the tree makes about dealing with the environment and the nourishment and things around it, what does it do with all these inputs to create a fruit, a result, of its living, that is what we are judged on. And that's going to determine, is it good fruit? Did you do good stuff or did you do bad stuff? 
that is going, your choices and your agency is going to determine where you end up. Do you get saved or not? That's basically what he's talking about here. Verse 10, and the people asked him saying, what shall we do then? And he answereth and saith unto them, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. He that hath meat, let him do likewise. So this is about charity, giving. If you are here and somebody's here, give them what you have and become equal. Let's let's even things out. Some you could say, uh, you know, early principle of consecration here. Now, verse twelve. And then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? So publicans are are the tax collectors. Basically, they're the people who are they're Jewish, but they work for the Roman government. So they're hated by the rest of the Jews. They see them as traitors. This is where. Matthew was a publican. So they're coming to him going, what shall we do about art? We want to be saved too. Verse 13, he said unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed to you. So be honest. Don't take more money from people than you need to. Don't be onerous in these taxes and these things that you're, you know, gathering from people. Now verse 14, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him saying, and what shall we do? These are Roman soldiers. And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely. And be content with your wages. So don't make work for yourself so you can get more money. This was a common thing. I mean, these Roman soldiers had nothing to do but hang out. They were kind of the police. They were kind of stationed at different places just in case something happens. Uh, until something happens, though, they just chill. They just hang out. And so if you think about it, and they get more rewards based on the performance of what they do. So if there's nothing happening, there's nothing to give them rewards. So they're, what, what John is saying is, guys, you need to be honest and have integrity with the people around you. Don't make a scandal so that you can solve the scandal, so that you can make more money and get more prizes and extra stuff. You're creating a system to reward yourself at the expense of others. You're creating stress and problems for others, basically, so you can do more. So that's that's the, the what John is telling them, basically. Be content with your wages. Stop trying to manipulate the system and, and ruin other people's lives because of it. Uh, verse 15, as the people were in expectation and all men mused in their hearts, of John, whether he were the Christ or not. So people are going, they're thinking about this going, wow, this guy is amazing at what he's teaching. Maybe he is the Messiah. He's kind of this outlier, weird guy, uh, which kind of makes sense in some of our minds to think of him as a Messiah. Maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he is the the Christ, which is the, the Greek version for Messiah, basically. Uh, and John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In who, Now, I'm going to pause for just a second here. Let's look at this, okay? Uh, Helen, the mother of Constantine in the 300s AD, uh, she went to Bethlehem to find the place where Jesus was born. She consulted with the people there that a common consent was formed that Jesus was born near a cave. When the place was identified, she built a church there. Today, it's called the Church of the Nativity. Christians go there on Christmas to celebrate the holiday. Uh, when you walk behind the altar, there are stairs descending to see where they think Jesus was actually born. Interesting. I don't know where that came from. That's, I think that's a quote out of, that should be in Luke chapter 2. I'm going to have to fix that in my notes. Um, sorry about that. A little interesting. There actually is a church there that you can go see that uh, that uh, to see where this cave where they think Christ was born. Um, sorry. That's weird that that was even in there. Okay, so back to the back to John the Baptist. Okay, he shall baptize you. He's John's now preaching about Christ coming, basically. Verse seventeen: Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. And will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with the unquenchable fire. So verse 17, John is now eliciting harvest symbols. 
okay? If Jesus has a fan, he is making the wind that allows the separation of the wheat from the chaff. Okay, so that's what he's talking about here. So when you have wheat, when you harvest wheat, you cut the head off the stem of the wheat and you gather those in and then you rub them together or like you put a cover over the top and beat them with a stick. You're trying to separate the wheat kernel from the chaff, which is the outside, the insoluble fiber on the outside of the wheat. So they separate that off and it breaks those up. So the insoluble fiber is very light. The wheat kernel in the middle is heavy. So then when you have a wind, and a lot of times they would put these, they're called threshing floors. It's kind of like a, it's like an awning. Basically, you just build a, a ceiling, you build a roof over your head, but the walls are open to allow the wind to blow through. As the wind blows through, you have this shovel, and after you have, have beaten the wheat to break them up, to get them off, to get them off the, uh, if you've never messed with wheat, some of those points are really sharp. Uh, so you want to separate the separate them off the main stem because you want to throw the stem out. And then you want to get the chaff, the hull, the, sh the shell outside the wheat berry to break open to release the wheat berry. But instead of having to sift through it and pick one out at a, at a, at a time, it just takes it's just too tedious to do. What they learned was, hey, this chaff is light. If we get a breeze and we throw it in the air, the chaff will be carried off, even if it's just carried over to the side and set down, but the wheat berries will drop straight back down. And uh, that's, that's what they did. So this is a more efficient way to do it, rather than have to sort through everything and pick them all apart and separate them on your own. So these threshing floors were usually on hilltops where the, you could get the wind going better through there. If there is no wind, then you would have people blow fans that would cause a wind so that you can separate the wheat from the chaff. So what, again, verse 17 is Christ is coming and he is going to do this. This is his work. Again, he is going to be a point in life with his teachings and his actions that will force all of us to have to say, is he real or not? Do we follow him or not? It's all about a test. That's what this life is about. The test is, are we willing to keep the commandments of God and do what he has asked us to do or not? That's what it comes down to. So that's the separation. The chaff are the ones who chose not to follow God. They're the ones that move off. The wheat berries, the, the more substantial ones, drop straight down. He preserves those and he burns the chaff, basically. Uh, so that's this metaphor that John's saying. That Christ is here. He's, he's, he's the one that's going to do all this. Verse 18, and many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. Wouldn't it be nice if we had more of those teachings? Uh, verse 19, but Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herod Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for all the evils which Herod had done. Now that's, we, we talk about this a lot in Matthew. You can go watch those videos as well. So just a little bit here, Herod the Tetrarch, okay, he's not, he's the son of Herod the Great. His brother Philip married a woman, Herodias. Herod the Tetrarch decided, I'm in love with Herodias. And Herod the Tetrarch was over more, he had a little bit more influence or affluence in what he was doing. And Herodias is like, I married the wrong brother. This guy's not going anywhere politically. He's, he doesn't have good ambitions. Herod does. I'm going to ditch my husband, Philip, and marry his brother because Herod has more political aspirations, more opportunities for gain more power and influence and affluence. So they combined, Herod tossed his wife to the side, married Herodias, and they they became a couple, and John the Baptist was very vocal about that was a bad idea. That was a stupid thing to do. You should not do that. That's not a good thing. So John was kind of a push was a he pushed back against Herod the Tetrarch basically and Herodias. Uh, verse 20, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. So again, that's why John went to jail, because he had a beef with how Herod married his sister-in-law. Verse 21, now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying the heaven was opened. So this is, so there was a bunch of people that were there before John went to prison and were baptized. And Jesus happened to be one of these people. And then he got baptized. So we don't have as much 
the conversation between John and Jesus, that's, we have that more in like Matthew. Uh, but we have, uh, I think, I think, I think it's Matthew. Uh, Mark might've mentioned that a little bit, but I think, I think Matthew had a lot of details on that too. Uh, so verse 22, uh, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. So Luke gives us this idea of a bodily shape, like a dove. Not a, not so much saying just an image of the dove. So he gets a little more distinct in here. Uh, the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith he said, The sign of the dove was instituted before the creation of the world, a witness for the Holy Ghost, and the devil cannot come in the sign of a dove. The Holy Ghost is a personage and is in the form of a personage. It does not confine itself to the form of the dove, but the sign in the sign of the dove. The Holy Ghost cannot be transformed into a dove, but the sign of a dove was given to John to signify the truth of the deed, as the dove is an emblem or token of truth and innocence. So that was Joseph Smith's opinion on, on that idea. Uh, verse 23, And Jesus himself, being about 30 years of age, being as he was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, which was the son of Mathat, which was the son of Levi. So if you notice, we're getting into Joseph's genealogy again. And we got this also in Matthew, at the beginning of Matthew. So why two genealogies? Why, were, why did they add these in here? Uh, a lot of scholars believe that the purpose of this was, one, to show the genealogy from Christ to David, to prove he is the lineage of David, which is the lineage of the Messiah, the King of Israel. Uh, two is to show the dependency from Christ to Abraham, that there's that connection as well. And clarify meaning of the title Messiah, to show us uh, Christ is the Messiah, the, sa the Savior, the person who will come to save us, basically. Uh, now, some people do speculate that Matthew maybe was the genealogy of Mary, or maybe this one was, but it's not. Because this one actually specifically just says, this is the son of Joseph. Basically, so we're doing Joseph. These both are Joseph's uh, genealogy, basically. Okay. Uh, now, what's interesting, verse 24, the son of Mathat, some think that why Luke shows Joseph's dad is different than Matthew. Okay, so Joseph, which was the son of Heli, which was the son of Mathat. Okay, Matthew is different because in Matthew, Jacob was his legal father, but he died, and so his wife was married to his brother Heli, who was the legal dad in Luke. So there's, there's some contrast here, some, some contradiction that Matthew says again. Uh, Matthew says that Joseph's dad was uh, Heli, or not, or Matthew thought it was Jacob, but in Luke it's Heli. And so that's what they say here, that uh, uh, Jacob was his legal father, but that he died, and so his wife was married to his brother Heli, who was the legal dad in Luke. So that the lever at marriage, remember when one man dies, his wife goes to the next one, next brother down. So that's why there's a lever at marriage in here, which is why it's different than in Matthew. Um, so Joseph would be genetically related to Heli, but he was seen legally as the son of Jacob. Some scholars think Luke is giving us Mary's genealogy. It was common to not add a woman's name to the genealogy role, so they are using Joseph's name as the placeholder for her. But the rest of the genealogy is her. So some think that's what it is. Not all scholars agree with this. There is not much as far as real evidence of this theory of Mary's genealogy. The Jews who lived in Tiberias claim to have a tradition of this. Luke tends to focus more on Mary's side of Jesus' story versus Matthew's telling Joseph's story more. But there is nothing definite that shows it is Mary's genealogy. So that's the challenge. Some people look at this and go, Luke tells the story of Mary more than anybody else. But also, you got to realize Luke tells a story of women and minorities more than the others as well. So it's not just Mary's story. He includes more women in this uh, throughout all of it, as well as other disadvantaged groups. So there's not enough evidence to say this is Mary's lineage. Is it possible if, so if this was Mary's lineage, okay, if, if instead of the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, if Mary was the daughter of Heli, Heli is the brother of Jacob, which is the dad of Joseph in the Matthew version. If this is true, if this is Mary's 
stuff, then Joseph and Mary were first cousins. That's what that would imply. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. Okay, like I said, most scholars think this is actually Joseph's telling of the story, but there was a Leverett marriage. So he's technically Joseph's son genetically, but legally he's also Heli's son as well because of the Leverett marriage laws. Uh, so that's what we see here. Now, I'm not going to read through all of these. You can read through these if you'd like. Um, it's fine. It says they're pretty similar to what Matthew has. Matthew makes a few other changes in there as well because remember, Matthew wanted to have only certain number of generations between Abraham and between David and David to Jesus, and it doesn't match up perfectly. The real genealogy doesn't match up, match up perfectly, so Matthew left a few people out. Uh, which I think we get here in Luke. We, Luke's not so worried about that, trying to make this perfect number timing of everything. Um, now, ver, verse 31, which was the son of, so which was the son of Mattatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David. Uh, that's actually, they talk about this Nathan in the book of Enoch. Uh, so continuing on down here, let's jump to, uh, oh no, sorry, sorry, let me, let me look at this. Verse 31, the son of Nathan, which was the son of David. Okay, so let's look at this. Now, an alternative genealogy is given in the book of the B, and it reads that David begot Nathan, David, Nathan begot Mattathiah, and it goes down through all of this. So this is, and then Heli begot Joseph. So this matches up with Luke's genealogy. So in the book of the B, which is an apocryphal writing, there is a genealogy given for Joseph. And it matches with Luke, uh, so more than more than Matthew's, basically. So there's that's another document uh, of, of ancient record that is corroborating that Luke is accurate in his his genealogy. So that could be maybe maybe whoever wrote the Book of the Bee got it from Luke. Maybe we don't know, but that shows there's more. If it's talked about the same. In, in multiple places, then that's probably an indication that it was probably accurate, the truth at the time, basically. Uh, so if we get down here to verse 37, was the Enoch one, which was the son of Enoch. That's the Enoch uh, that's a great-grandfather of Noah, basically. So the thing that's interesting about Luke is Matthew, again, goes back to Abraham. But Luke, if you look at this, he goes way past Abraham because now we're back to Enoch in verse 37, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Mahalil, Malalil, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So he goes right back to Adam. And Matthew didn't go back that far. Matthew went to Abraham. But Luke goes all the way back to Adam, basically. Uh, the interesting thing about verse 38, Bruce R. McConkie in his Dr. New Testament commentary made this comment. He said, this statement found also in Moses 6.22, has a deep and profound symbolism and also means what it says. Father Adam came as indicated to this sphere, gaining an immortal body because death had not yet entered the world. Jesus, on the other hand, was the only begotten in the flesh, meaning to a world of mortality where death already existed. So this is, this is really fascinating when you look at this idea, okay? Because he's going back to Adam and he says, which was the son of God. Who was before Adam? Nobody. Adam was created by God and then was in the world. Nobody had died yet, not until Abel was death introduced to the world. And so that Seth was one of the other children of, uh, of Adam and Eve, and Seth is where the patriarchal lineage goes through. Uh, so the, there's interesting symbolism here that Adam entered a world without death. and He was the first son of God on earth, but yet Christ entered a world that had death in it, and then overcame the world. So some interesting things we get to learn there. Well, let's jump now to the next chapter as we continue the story of Jesus.